Welcome to Business Better, a podcast designed to help businesses navigate the new normal. I'm your host, Steve Burkhart. After a long career at global consumer products company BIC, where I served as Vice President of Administration, General Counsel, and Secretary, I'm now of counsel in the litigation department at Ballard's Bar, a law firm with clients across industries and throughout the country. This episode is part of our Women in Leadership series and features an interview with Selena Rezvani, author of Pushback, How Smart Women Ask and Stand Up For What They Want. She's also a consultant who specializes in leadership and development programs. Today's topic is negotiations and self-advocacy. Understanding your goals and those of your partner or adversary are critical to success in every negotiation. Much can be learned from Selena's advice about self-worth, productivity, the U-shaped curve, GPS, and being curious, not furious. Her closing comments about face plants and linking are sure to make you pause and chuckle. Speaking with Ms. Ravani is my Ballard Spar colleague, Emily Ninen, a partner in our Wilmington, Delaware, and Washington, D.C. offices, and co-chair of Ballard Spar's finance department. So now let's join Emily and her guest, Selena Rizvani. Selena, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm not actually sure how we were introduced, but I received your Quick Confidence newsletter, and so it may have been mutual contacts on LinkedIn Regardless, I'm looking forward to delving a bit more into the topics of self-advocacy and negotiation. And here at Ballard, we are also thrilled that you've agreed to do a webinar for us during Women's History Month in March. So our conversation today will serve as a little preview for people of what to expect then as well. Selena, I want to start by asking you about your story. You know, give us some background on where you grew up and what you wanted to be as a little kid. And what was the path that led you to become the author, speaker, and consultant you are today? Thank you, Emily. And I'm so glad we got connected. Uh, however, those um, magical beings in the LinkedIn universe, you know, did that for us. And I'm really excited for our March event. Yeah, you know, I, I like to tell people I grew up in Ukrainistan, Adelphia, because I'm half Ukrainian, I'm half Pakistani, and of course, you know, where did I get raised? Philadelphia. And, you know, the thing is, I definitely grew up learning to defer to authority, to be humble, to take just enough. You know, maybe others can relate to that or or were raised a similar way to be accommodating to others. That was a big one in my house. And the problem was by the time I reached the work world, um, I realized many of those traits didn't help me in important situations in certain high stakes moments. You know, for example, putting forward like the unpopular idea in a meeting, not just going with the flow, you know, but being willing to be the different voice or telling my boss I was drastically underpaid, you know, and really standing firm in my conviction. And I think so many of those experiences helped me kind of find my voice over time and gave me a passion and a mission to help other women, you know, embrace their power, find their own inner advocate, because every good thing that happened to me in my career, you know, self-advocacy played a role in it. And and I want to spread that kind of exciting vehicle to find opportunities in, in, in other people's lives. Okay. I didn't know you were from Philly. I am as well. So we'll have to talk about that. So Selena, on social media and other platforms, you talk about confidence, negotiation, and self-advocacy. What issues are you focused on currently? And has the pandemic changed the questions you're being asked today? I really like that question, Emily. Um, you know, I, I do love talking about these topics um, because I think no matter how senior or successful or established you are, you can always improve at 
resolving issues and conflicts or proposing exciting new ideas, right? We all want to be better at these things. Where I've evolved my thinking more recently is around advocating healthy boundaries. You know, I've been so inspired um, by, you know, public figures, by friends and peers, individuals who've asserted their boundaries, right? Think about Simone Biles or Naomi Osaka are just a few examples of people who made really bold moves this year to advocate their own self-care, their mental health, their needs. And I think helping people with this notion that your worth is not tied to your productivity, you know, it's become really important to me. It's something I, I need to reinforce in myself. You know, you can be ambitious and, and enjoy what you do. So many of us get on a roll, right? But sometimes that advocacy conversation you need to have is between you and you, you know, about healthy boundaries. And so I think that's a place my thinking is evolving. Last year, I had the delightful opportunity to interview Lois Frankel, who wrote Why Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. And I had read her book probably 15 years ago. And that's really how I discovered how much deference I gave to age and experience and how that probably wasn't helping me in the workplace. And I know you mentioned that earlier as well. But you refer to yourself as a recovering good girl. What do you mean by that? Uh, why was it a barrier to negotiating for you? Yeah, well, let me first just say Lois is incredible. And uh, I'm one of her biggest fangirls. I think she is really the, the definition also of women helping women. She has personally helped me in my career and wrote the foreword for my book, Pushback. So I, I can't say enough good things about Lois and how much I admire her. But you know, the recovering good girl thing is real. It's real. You know, for me, it looked like some something similar to what you said, Emily, being deferential, always thinking I need to be communal and, and, you know, think always with that community mindset. Of course, that's important. And there's a time and place for that. But there are also times and places for you to discuss and surface your own needs. Going with the flow, I mentioned that, that that was a big thing that was hard for me to do. Some of these attributes don't help you get your needs met, right? And they don't help you have uh, relationships with open lines of communication. Because here's another thing about when you don't advocate, when you just go with the flow, let's say with a boss, you don't give the other person a chance to cure your pain you know, to to help you get your need met. So whether that's a piece of equipment you feel you need to have a home office that works, or it's a bigger request, you know, hey, I'd really like more, more responsibility. And I'd like, you know, a different quality of assignments coming my way, not just the kind of grunt work assignments. You know, if you don't say that and you keep it to yourself, right, the other person can't improve. They can't uh, do anything about it. And so I think that was a really important realization for me as well is, wait, you know, you give people a chance to make it better when you do this. But the other thing is, you know, one of the things I, I've researched is that women's happiness over the course of their lifetimes is U-shaped. It's U-shaped, which means we're happiest in our young adult careers and we're happier, you know, 50 plus and over. And I'm a big believer in doing the most we can to, you know, flatten that in middle age or in between, you know, to not settle for suboptimal or, you know, this doesn't work so great for me, but I'll go along with it, you know, I'll be okay with it, but instead asking for what you need. So one of the things I believe is that the best negotiators in the world, you know, they don't have this one ninja move, Emily, <laughs> that they use. It's more of a mindset. You know, they believe everything is up for revision. Everything is discussable. You know, everything is open to tweaking or changing. And I think that's a great mindset that can help you certainly has helped me overcome that recovering good girl thing that, wait, let's discuss this. Let's not settle so quickly. So as you've sought to flatten out your own U-shape of happiness, tell us about the most meaningful thing you've ever negotiated. 
Yeah, you know, it's uh, there's a few in my life, in my personal life and career, but one stands out above all for me. And, um, you know, like a lot of teenagers, I had big dreams to go to college uh, one day. But in my family, we lost my dad very suddenly in my teenage years. And, and that was devastating on a million levels. But we struggled more financially from that point onward. And college didn't look like such a you know sure thing on the horizon. Well, fast forward to college, uh, I got into one I really loved. They offered me some financial aid. And my wonderful mom said, I will scrape together what it takes to cover the rest of your tuition. And she did. Single moms are amazing, by the way. And, and my mom totally was for me. And I was excited to get that financial aid package for year two. And lo and behold, Emily, it was way smaller, you know, the aid dollars they were offering. And my mom said, honey, I can't swing it. I can't do this and send you back. And uh, I realized I needed to be my own advocate in that moment. And uh, I appealed that financial aid package. I wrote a long appeal letter to the financial aid office. And I said, please keep me here. Please, you know, here are the ways I would like to contribute to the community. Here are the million jobs I will take on (laughs) from admissions to the cafeteria to to make this worth it to you. Um, And to my shock, to my happy shock, they changed that. They kept me there for not just year two, but for year three and for year four also. And they gave me all those jobs as well. So, you know, I think I learned in that moment that asking for what you want can sometimes change the course of your life, you know, and that even though you can have loved ones and sponsors and mentors and people rallying for you, nobody is going to ask on your behalf. You know, you really have to be your own vocal champion. And boy, was that a good lesson to learn as a young woman, you know, at 18. Yeah, that's wonderful that you, it's too bad that you had to learn it that way. And for that reason, but it's a great lesson. I'm sure you carry in your lifetime. It was a wonderful and important outcome as well. I'm a strong believer that almost any skill can be learned. I'm not sure all those skills are transferable, but you say that self-advocacy is a transferable skill. How so? It is. I believe that as business professionals, as legal practitioners, right, there are so many ways you advocate every day you know, ways you are already doing this, whether it's um, advocating for project priority to move your project up the list, um, maybe something you're working on firm-wide or an internal initiative, right? Certainly to, you know, advocate for clients and the quality of an item they're going to get, the approach on a project, you know, a direct reports development, all kinds of things, you know, a more realistic timeline. The truth is we are all doing this all the time. My question for those listening is, what if you brought that same ferocious advocacy you bring to delighting clients and internal you know, customers and stakeholders to those areas that could benefit you? Things like your title, you know, your performance rating in some cases, you know, the projects you're assigned, and certainly things like pay and promotions. You know, um, I think one of the important ways we make a bridge to negotiating more often is by claiming some credit for the ways we're already doing it. And, And I think when we see that connection, it's much easier to negotiate even more often and even more strategically, which is what I'm all about (laughs) teaching. So in negotiation, sometimes our proposals fall flat because they come across as benefiting only one party. How can we show the other side that there is a mutual benefit? Yeah, well, you know, that's a really important point because I think one of the things we don't want to do in a negotiation or when we're trying to persuade somebody is to make the conversation feel like me, 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 right? Can I have? Here's what I want. 
um, here's what I plan to do with it or what I'll get. That's not exactly a way to entice somebody who's, you know, busy and has many competing priorities. So I think a better way is, is a framework I love to share with people. And it's called GPS. GPS, just like what you have in your car um, or in your phone, right? And what that stands for is goals, passions, and struggles. So how can you, before that negotiation ever happens, right, as you're thinking about what you want to propose, whether it's a flexible work arrangement, a brand new role that doesn't exist yet at your organization, or something smaller, How can you stand in the shoes of your counterpart and ask yourself, what is a goal of theirs that I could further with the same proposal? Or what's a passion or a cause they care deeply about, right, that I could make a connection to? Or what's a struggle? You know, what's a pain point that I could in some way alleviate with my request? You don't need to hit all three of these things, but just taking the time to ask these questions before any strategic conversation can go a long way to flipping that conversation from me, 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 to we. And that's powerful. I want to give you just a really quick example of someone who did this, a woman named Sonia She worked in financial services and her boss would complain to her in a good natured way about some projections he had to come up with every two weeks. And and so he had to come up with this set of numbers and give some analysis to the senior leaders in his organization. You know, here's what we can expect. Here's what the fluctuations mean. And guess what? When it came time for Sonia to ask for more responsibility, she asked to assume those projections. And part of her pitch was, look, I know this is a goal you're on the hook for, and I know it's a burden on your time, right? And and so think about how yesable, you know, she made her request by thinking about the other person's GPS, okay? And by the way, it was no one was shocked when about 18 months later, she got a promotion to a VP level, right? Because Suddenly, she was the one sending around the really smart analysis, getting visibility with senior leaders in her organization. So such a really crucial step, I think, when you're going to ask for something and propose something new and different, think about their GPS. That's a great example. Thank you. Uh, You warn people that if you dislike the terms now, you'll hate them later. Tell us more about that. Well, you know, if you sense all is not right with, let's say, the deal terms or something that you're working out with a vendor, a contract or a job offer, you know, you sense something's off that twitch in your solar plexus, you know, is telling you all is not right here. Maybe you don't know what it is. At a minimum, buy yourself more time and trust that sense that this doesn't feel good, you know, this doesn't quite feel fair or reasonable. You know, I think sometimes that urge, if you are a recovering people pleaser, to say, okay, or yeah, sure, we can do it that way, happens, you know, sometimes before we even realize it. And I think it's so important to really trust, again, that twitch that says, no, no, you know, I need to think this through more or I'm feeling uncomfortable about this. And like I said, buy yourself more time at a minimum to think it through and come back with maybe your objections or, you know, a better solution, a better request that could meet everybody's needs. I did this, by the way, in one role. I I made this mistake. and. I had actually gone into a new job situation. I had interviewed for a job and I I liked the role, but I didn't like the pay very much. I thought it should be higher. I thought, you know, that would be fair. And I negotiated for higher pay and they were insistent. This is not negotiable. It is what it is. Kind of take it or leave it. And in that moment, I kind of told myself, well, you know, the culture is nice enough and, you know, the people seem nice enough and this role looks pretty well suited to me. You know, I kind of justified it. 
And guess what? My resentment didn't decrease over time in being underpaid. You know, I felt it more. And that's what I mean by if you don't like the terms now, you're only going to hate them later. It doesn't usually work the other way, you know, where you say, ah, it'll grow on me. <laughs> um, now, the good thing in that situation was I, I was able to renegotiate um, my role and including my pay after about 13 months in that job. And I'm really glad I did. So, you know, when you do get a no the first time around, part of my advice is hold that lightly. Don't see it as the end of the road and the end of the conversation. See it really like a pivot and an invitation for you to either make a different request or to come back and ask at another time. And then when you say buy yourself more time, are you talking about a response that says, let me think about that or let me come back to you tomorrow? Or how would you have bought yourself more time? Sure. So, um, you know, one of them could simply be, you know, saying to the recruiter I, I was working with, hmm, you know, I hear you telling me you can't move on the dollar amount. You asked me to get back to you tomorrow. I I'd like to ask for more like the next week to consider that decision, um, you know, because this changes the parameters for me. You know, that's what I'm talking about in terms of buying yourself more time. And I say that because in your career, for anyone listening, there's going to be what I call exploding offers, <laughs> right? Which is when people put tremendous pressure on you to answer a negotiation like yesterday. And the pressure they put on you is this whole thing will go away if you don't give me an answer. And it's a tactic, right? It, it, it makes it hard for us to really look at the whole picture or the entire offer and to really give it the careful thought it might deserve. And I would encourage you to push back on that and advocate for the time you need. Expect that you're going to be hurried in your career at times, whether it's from a recruiter or somebody else who makes you feel like that might go away. And tell them, you know, I'd really be comfortable with a timeline more like X. One other quick example of that, Emily, that I think happens a lot, and I think happens a lot to women, is what I call the kind of drive-by negotiation, you know, where somebody stops you in the hallway and maybe you're like gathering up your stuff and walking out to go. And it's like, hey, something just came up and I, I need you to stay late. In that moment, there can be a huge urge to say, okay, what do you need? And do it. But sometimes that's a place where you can buy yourself some time and elongate the window so that you don't just say yes. Um, and it might look like saying, oh, okay, I, I can hear you that that sounds like a, a stressful situation. I need to check my workload and then come right back to you and let you know if I can do it, or I need to look at my calendar and let you know um, if I can fit this in right now. Or in some cases, it's, I need to talk to my partner, right? To, to let you know if this is even um, something I can do and honor tonight. So that's, that's another way we can, you know, elongate that window of negotiation and not feel pressured to just work with the, the time window we've been given. You mentioned earlier that when you get a no answer to kind of hold it lightly um, and go back to it at a later time. Do you have any other advice for getting past roadblocks or the dreaded no answer? Yeah, it is dreaded, isn't it? That so much of the time when I ask people what stops you from doing this and, and asking for what you need, that that's it. It's no, I'm afraid of that rejection and what it could mean. And so one of the things I encourage people to do is to get comfortable asking diagnostic questions. Get curious, not furious is another way to think about this. If you get a no, you know, maybe somebody says to you after you pitch an exciting role where there's tons of value in creating this role in the organization and they say something to you like, you're not ready. I don't think you're ready for that. Or... Uh, timing's not great. You know, there's this vague no that we can get sometimes. Being willing to say something like, well, can you share more about your rationale behind that? 
or I hear you telling me uh, I'm not ready. Can you say more about what ready would look like? Right. One of the women I interviewed for my book, Pushback, I have such admiration for. Her name's Dee Dee Wilson, and she was a CFO at Nike when I interviewed her. And she said, I, you know, I was told at one point, you're not CFO material. And she said, you know, not only is that <laughs> psychologically kind of crushing feedback, you know, but she said, it's not actionable. There's nothing I can do with that. And she said, my advice to others is to really insist on objective criteria. You know, if somebody gives you a no or a vague no, really peel that onion back uh, and try to get to the real reason or something that you can take action on. And, and that's exactly how she got her promotion to CFO. You know, she said, what exactly am I lacking? You know, financial acumen, um, people management skills, uh, visible projects within the organization. And she said, I project managed my way to that promotion. And so I think that's a great piece of advice. If you're not getting that objective criteria, keep going. Keep asking those meaty questions so you can diagnose what the real issue is, right? Because we don't have a chance to fix it if we don't know what it is. So push for that. Push for that important data. One more thing we can do when we, we get that no is, you know, work on our pitch. Work on our pitch. Think about, can I tweak this 25 degrees differently, you know, to make the value shine through? Or can I consult with somebody even further along, uh, you know, on the road than I am to make this proposal stronger or better? I know I was really crushed in my own career when I got a painful no. I was um, interviewing to be a global spokesperson for a large tech company, and I was so excited about the impact I could make, but I didn't get it. And I got one of those polite, no, thank you. Uh, emails. It was great to meet you, Selena. We're going to go in another direction, but stay in touch. And after licking my wounds, you know, and having some rosé and lots of mint Milano cookies, I went back to them and I said, hey, I know that didn't work out, but here's an idea for a different way we could partner. What do you think? And you know what, Emily? Just like that, they said yes. You know, so it goes back to that idea of hold your nose lightly. Don't see them as written in cement and, and final. Be willing to be tenacious. Well, you have given us so much to think about and a lot of great takeaways about giving people a chance to make things right, to hold your nose lightly, to be curious, not furious. So thank you so much for your time. And I want to be respectful of it. So I'm going to end with this question, Selena. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self? Wow, thank you for the gift of that question, Emily, because it's a nice thing to think about, I think, and look back. You know, I'd say be more experimental. Don't be so scared to get it wrong. You know, wink at your faults and, and make more face plants. That's where you're going to learn. Ooh, easier said than done, but <laughs> we'll try. We'll try. <laughs> we'll do it together. <laughs> well, Selena, thank you again for joining me today. I look forward to chatting with you again on March 9th during our webinar, Negotiate Like a Boss, How to Be a Fierce Self-Advocate. Until then, stay well. Thanks again to Emily Nynan and Selena Rizvani. Make sure to visit our website, www.bowersbar.com, where you can find the latest news and guidance from our attorneys. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. If you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please email podcast at bowersbar.com. Stay tuned for a new episode coming soon. Thank you for listening.